Hello, welcome to episode two of Glambitious Live. I am the creator of the Glambitious brand, Lily Mae, and I am so excited to reconnect with my girls and bring a special guest to the stage today as well. Uh, let me kick it over to Majesty and Winter so they can introduce themselves. Cool. Hey, y'all. Majesty, I am a Charlotte-based blogger and creator, founder of Ignite Your Influence, a community for creators, wife, foodie, fun time, and happy to enjoy this girl talk we're going to do today on Glam Vicious Live. Uh, so I am Winter Patterson. I am your self-love advocate. I'm a talk show host, TV personality, and many of you know me from Ready to Love Season 3 on the OWN Network. Super, super happy to be here with you today. Yes, yes. So the first, you know, bit of breaking news is Miss Rihanna becoming a billionaire. That excited my heart and soul as if she was my cousin and could loan me a little something. But, you know, what were your thoughts when you heard that Rihanna made it to billionaire status, Majesty? I love Riri. And anytime a black woman wins, we all win one. But it just, to me, she took a risk of getting out of her comfort zone with music because she was successful and literally just killed it with expanding completely new business models. And, and I feel like it was like a blueprint for women to just feel comfortable, like exploring other ventures. Like she was good at music, but music has this kind of reputation to like age people out or like you can be hot and then you're not. But I'm like, she bought out Fenty Beauty. She bought out um, Savage, the lingerie, put Victoria's Secret to shame. She bought skincare, and I just love to see it. And it was great. Like, how many times do celebrities like launch brands, and it's like, are we buying this because you're a celebrity, but it's not good? Um, I love Fenty lip gloss. I like her stuff. So um, I was rooting for Riri with this. She deserved the coin in this particular circumstance. <laughs> Yeah, I'm all, you know, I'm super women's empowerment. So like you said, when one of us win, all of us win. And so like, I'm like, you know, when I heard, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Another one of us did it. So I'm just, I'm just overjoyed for her. And if she never wants to sing again, that's fine. You know, like I'm okay with that. She's built a brand that I support. Like you said, it's very good products. And I'm like, go girl. You get to choose what you want to do. You don't let the world tell you what you should be doing. Exactly. Like that's, I think the, the biggest thing that excites me about Rihanna is that she did things her way. And even from the onset of her career, they were like, oh, we need you to be blind. We, she's like, no, nope, I'm going to have jet black hair and what? And I'm going to sell these records and I'm going to do me and I'm going to be outspoken. You know, I'm going to really be my authentic self and y'all are going to love it. So that is what excites me the most about Rihanna is just doing things her way. And honestly, I feel like we could kind of learn a lesson about working smarter, you know, and not necessarily harder. Because when you think about getting on stage and turning and, and compromising the integrity of your knees, because you, you know, 30 something trying to twerk on stage to entertain people, like that's a lot of work. That is not easy, you know? And I just feel like Rihanna's probably in her penthouse taking those Zoom meetings from her plush, you know, bedroom and just collecting the billions. And it also made me think of like, uh, you know, Kim Kardashian and Kylie in the sense of, you know, Kim Kardashian works very, very hard. But then Kylie came out and said, you know what? I'm going to inject my lips and sell y'all some lip gloss. Billionaire status. So I'm like, Lord, you know, <laughs> that's the epitome of working smarter. And I, I'm, I'm trying to work smarter. OK. <laughs> yeah, Riri killed it. Another, another way she killed it was she was very inclusive. I think from her makeup line, a lot of foundation brands get slack for not being inclusive with shade range. She came in giving all the shades. Um, I think her even her campaigns represented a lot of diversity. Her lingerie was very inclusive to like all sizes. So I just think she did a good job not excluding people. Um, and she just marketed it in her own way. And I love that you got to see a different side of her. Like she was doing skincare tutorials and she was doing makeup tutorials. I was like, oh my God, Riri, just like us putting on foundation in the mirror like a normal woman uh so i just think it's great i don't know if she'll ever go back to music if i'm honest with you right right well i hope she does because I, I do like a little rude boy boy and it did it did like i don't know what she was saying but i liked it right so winter you were telling us something about this something that's going on in hollywood with people in hygiene right what were you telling us about that what, what's going on in hollywood with the with the hygiene situation <laughs> um i just ran across a couple of memes and started doing research and i started hearing about how a lot of celebrities are you know very you know 
happy to share that they don't bathe on a regular basis, that they don't, you know, wash and, and they're okay with that. They wait until, and even their kids, they said they don't bathe them until they start to smell, like they wait for the smell. And I just, you know, I was not raised like that. Let me just say that first. Um, I don't know anyone who, you know, <laughs> behaves in that manner. And so it was really shocking to think that these millionaires were very, very proud to say that they don't bathe. And I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, us, but it was a lot. Of course of it wasn't. <laughs> of course it wasn't. It wasn't. It I, wasn't I'm like, listen, our mamas be like, no, come out of my house smelling like outside. They be cussing us out. No, 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 no. We have to right. wash multiple times. <laughs> yeah, or if you came in the house and you sweaty, your mother be like, um, go get in the bath or go fix that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think in minority households, we kind of over-index the opposite way. Like they always telling, you know, fix up nice, look presentable, put powder on. Like you just always, you didn't get a pass to be smelly. I think it's, do you think it's a wealth thing with celebrities or do you think it's just a racial upbringing difference? Like, is it like, oh, I got so much money, it doesn't matter? Let, I will say this, all right? I went to South Africa to the poorest part um, in the Soweto village. Poor, 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 very, very poor. So most of their homes were dirt floors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them invited us in. And when I tell y'all, their homes were absolutely clean, like pristine. And their kids, now these are the poorest people probably in the world, their kids were ironed and, and their clothes were pressed and they looked like they were going to private school because of how we, you know, are very intentional culturally to yeah. look good, smell good, present ourselves. And so I, I almost feel like it's a cultural thing. I could be wrong, but what do y'all think? Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like black mamas everywhere just disturbed. That's what I feel like. I feel like that news, I feel like black mamas everywhere just heard what you said, Winter, and they just shut it in their soul in the kitchen like, whoo, what was that? What was that? Because we just don't play that. That's all I know is that the black mamas don't play that. Don't play when, I mean, Majesty, you mentioned something else about grooming in Hollywood and how there's these new standards for male grooming. So tell us a little bit about, about that. Yeah, I was watching on Netflix Love is Blind series, which Lily Mae was featured on um, the original cast. But I watched that, like a special mini series. And it was interesting when the male characters on there talking about manscaping and him injecting um, his armpits with Botox because he didn't want to sweat through his T-shirts and him getting under eye fillers. And he's a young man, fit man, masculine man, probably like 28, I think is his age. And I was just like, I'm not used to men talking about like manscaping in this way to the point of like injections. Like it was just new to me. I was a little surprised. So um, I just wanted to throw it out to y'all. Like, how do you feel if you had a significant other and would you be okay with like fillers and like that level of maintenance or self-care? It was a little weird to me. I just That's a little, <laughs> yeah. Like I'm okay with the guy who's Metro. You know, metrosexual that we, you know, have the term that we have come to accept, which mm -hmm. is someone who is very intentional about their appearance, right? I'm okay with that, but if you're going to the plastic surgeon and getting injections and lipo, I think you've kind of moved into a realm that I'm not particularly particularly comfortable with. I want my man to kind of just be a, a dude, a man, you know what I mean? Yeah, you I, know, for me, I, I think I just have, you know, certain boundaries with it for example and i know it's unfair because i love a good lace front but man units i'm not with man units so what if you ball let's just beards. the unit beards are you okay with that no. i'm not okay with no kind of units on my man okay like it should they shouldn't even put it together man and units that don't go together so i just have standards however like i was telling majesty if we keep it real now Usher is out here about 48 years old looking 28. So you can't tell me Usher ain't had a little box here, a little box there. Like, and there's no judgment because he looked good. He make me want to fly to Vegas and put my life on the line to see him perform. So I'm not mad at it, but I'm like Mario Lopez. I met him a few years ago. Look, 18 years old. Mario Lopez probably about 62. Come on now. And he's looking <laughs> good 19, 20. I'm saying by the way, he did look good. Yes, a little bit of toxic, a little toxic. With celebrities, you don't think it's different. Like Usher might, I'm, you don't think Usher just might have good genes? I think Usher got a little tox. Winter, I was gonna say maybe even their skin, like 
think about the money he's had for so long. Like they can have an esthetician, they can have a barber. Like I think celebrity too, they have better just self care regimens and better teams to take care of them. Nutrition is, um, yeah, it's interesting. Like going back to the 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 lace front thing, like. My husband has a beard. He grew it out, got some beard oil, did the scruffy, and like is proud of it. I'm fine with that. But I wouldn't, if he taking that beard on and off at night, I'd be like, nah, bro. <laughs> no. What if he was <laughs> like, look, we about to eat. Hold on. No. <laughs> and, and I know it's a double standard because like I wear my wig and I will snatch my wig off in a second. And and I think the double standard too is like women can wear makeup to cover up concealer you know it's certain things we can do to kind of spice up but i'm I'm with y'all in that i like my man a little little rough around the edges the and yeah I, if you get a facial if you get a massage if you have a skincare regimen hygiene regimen we good you smelling good we good but if you like you said if you're going to get uh plastic surgery and exploring things that I ain't even done. We, we're not doing that. <laughs> right. It's a, it's, a, it's a little much. It's a little much. But you know, Usher, I love you. I'm your biggest fan. I'm not judging you if you got the talks. I'm not judging you at all. Let me just say that because I love me some Usher. Okay. Okay. But anyway, you know, we always have like a segment, like a spiritual segment where, you know, we talk about all things spiritual. And so I had to bring someone from my home team, uh, Miss Candice, to the forefront because she has a great book and she is such like a voice in the spiritual realm, but in a very contemporary way. Like I love uh, the, the way that she presents her theology, but to use the, the word on her, but her theology to the world. So I'm going to bring her up so we can chat with Miss Candice. Hi. Hey, girl. Hey, go ahead and introduce yourself and just tell everybody who you are and what you do if they're not familiar with you. So my name is Candice Marie Benbo, and I am a writer and a public theologian. And so what my work is uh, centered around thinking about Black women, our faith, our relationship to God, our relationship with God, and how that impacts uh, the world around us and 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 all that we do. So I'm really excited to be here today. Yes, and you know what I've admired from afar about your brand is that you bring like the the human side of being a woman in 2021. Like we don't have to you know have the church hat on and be completely buttoned up. Even in your bio it says theologian and twerker. I'm like yes, <laughs> put it together. Yeah, it together. I mean I think. I think so often we have, um, we've been taught that those parts of us can't be harm harmonious, right? And the truth is that we were created in fullness, right? That like, God knows all of our idiosyncrasies and, and spirit knows who we are. And we bring all of who we are to every experience we bring all of who we are to every scenario and circumstance and so all of all of us is good and all of us is holy at our core we're good creation and so leaning into that is is what i hope that my work always uh, pushes sisters to do and to think through yeah, and I really think that's good because I feel like there's a lot of judgment that uh, we grow up with when you grow up traditionally Christian. You grow up with this heavy sense of judgment, like God is up there like, oh, you did this wrong. You're going to hell. And so I love that, you know, you bring a reality to it that, no, God is love and you are holy even if you like to twerk. So now tell me a little bit about your book, Red Lip Theology. Yeah, so Red Lip Theology, um, the subtitle is uh, for church girls who can Consider tithing to the beauty supply store when Sunday morning isn't enough. Um, I, I literally created Red Lip Theology when I was in seminary at Duke. And inherent in that was this idea that Black people doing theology is just for Black people and we're not contributing <laughs> to the full discourse around faith. It really um, brought home to me how I feel about what it means to be a, a millennial woman who was born and raised in the church, as well as growing up at the time that hip hop was trying to find its way. And so there I am as churched as I am hip hop, right? Like that they are 
both parts of me. And so thinking through how we understand faith, how we think through as, as young women, um, I'm really excited because Relative Theology is a book that really takes these theological themes um, around creation, around salvation, um, things that we, one, take for granted that we know and understand, but but brings to bear contemporary understandings of it. Um, my background um, as a trained theologian, and then my love of beauty. So, so the the book actually follows the um, a regimen to a full face. So we start with skincare and move all the way to setting spray. And each essay takes a part of that um, and just really thinks about beauty, theology, culture, and Black womanhood. And I'm really excited. It comes out January the 11th. It's on pre-order now. Um, yeah, it's been a long time coming, but I'm really, really, really excited about it. That's so interesting. And I love what you're doing because as believers, as the saints, right? But we're in, we're in a season on social media that like our platforms in some ways can be our pulpits and not the traditional in-person pulpit. Yeah. I have this conversation with my family often because I'm a PK, like fourth generation PK, grandparents, great grandparents, wow. all my siblings. And then I'm the one on social media creating. And it's interesting because I have conversations with them often like, I don't have to be churchy, but when I have a story, when I have a testimony, when I've been through something and I story tell, like that can reach so many people who may never step foot in church. And I love that. I think the pandemic kind of changed church. If you think about traditional going to church, some people of a certain generation would be like, I would never watch church streaming. Like you want to watch your pastor on TV or I would never. And I think the pandemic made everyone go virtual or get used to live. And so now I think people are more open to consuming faith-based content, reading, right. podcast, streaming. And I think it's more mainstream. I think even now, like, I don't know if y'all experienced it growing up, people were really particular about makeup and hair and colors and what you wear. And now I think, like you said, you can wear a bow lip and not be titled a Jezebel. Or yeah. like, interesting. It's so interesting. I'll ask you this, because I know in your book, it sounds like you're approaching theology in such a fresh way and comparing it really in a feminine way. Yeah. How did you embrace studying kind of the traditional seminary style at Duke and kind of making it your own to something that you feel like millennial women can relate to? And one of the things that... Um, studying at Duke taught me was it gave me foundational understanding of theology. So I'm learning church history. The, the diff, one of the preconceived, one of the misconceptions about seminary and divinity school is that it's like elevated Bible study. It's not. <laughs> learning that fourth century, you have folks fighting each other about what they believe about Jesus. And then that's how we end up with the Bible, right? They will, there were so many opportunities and and um and ways that I was learning about scripture that I said yeah like it matters to have these conversations in ways that sisters can grasp some other studies have shown that black women are the most religious demographic in America mm -hmm. nine out of ten black women in the survey said that that faith is the most important and central aspect of who they are, right? And so if we lead the nation in religiosity, then it matters to always be able to have conversations about faith that center us. And so one of the things that is true about Black women we know where the beauty supply store is. <laughs> and we know what we need to get in those for whatever kind of slay we want to have. And we know how to get what we need. And so I was like, how do we, how do I find a way to combine these beauty ideals and principles in a way that lives for us? And I was really excited to think through it in that way. 
Um, in the book, I also talk about, I was in seminary at the time where I was coming out of a really bad breakup. I actually start the story there that my best friend came to visit me and her and my line sister took me to the mall and I was looking raggedy. I had to be really honest with them and say that when that relationship fell apart, I lost myself. There's a Sephora in there. And my best friend took me there, set me down, and they went to work. I left there with Makeup Forever Foundation and an Urban Decay Naked Palette. And my best friend made me promise that every day I would get up and make my face. Um, and, and so I'm going to seminary with a full face, <laughs> reminding myself that without a relationship, I'm still fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm beautiful. Yeah. I'm good. That was that was my formation. That like I'm in seminary. Also, you know, learning to put myself back together. And so for me, beauty, beauty participation, beauty industry participation, and theology went hand in hand and go hand in hand because that was what was happening in my personal life. Mm. Wow, that's so you know, one thing you touched on, you know, was, you know, the relationship that you had that dissolved and how that impacted a bit of your spiritual journey. And then you also mentioned how black women lead in, you know, being very religious. And what my single friends have been talking about lately was that it seems that there may be a pivot with black men becoming less religious and more spiritual. What is your advice for the religious woman that's single during a pandemic, but she's coming across men who are spiritual, who are not really sold on Jesus Christ right now. You know, they're, they're, moving in like a different direction. Like where does that leave the, the single Christian woman these days? Uh, I well, I'm going to have a completely different thought about that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, this is what I have told many a sister. I have always encouraged them to be open because several reasons within your faith context, when many people are saying like, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. What they're really, what they are saying is that the ways that maybe institutional church has been offensive or has been harmful to them, they are not rocking with that. But if you talk to them, you may find like, oh, like we have a lot in common. Like I think that same way. I may just have a different my language for how I articulate it may be different, right? So in that context, to be very open and have the conversation because you technically don't know that you might be on the same page with somebody, but your language is different, mm. right? For other sisters who are like, no, he's completely like, it's a different faith. I've dated men who weren't a Christian. And I enjoyed the experience. I think that a lot of us who were born and raised in the church, who are still single, would do well to open ourselves up to new experiences. And so I would just say be open. That's me. What about you, Winter? Actually, my my comment would have been pretty much exactly the same. I feel like religion puts people in a box. And that's why, um, you know, some of you know, I, you know, also a theologian went to theology school, used to preach in the pulpit very well. Um, and I've decided that ministry for me is going to be outside of the church because of some of the same reasons why other people have kind of moved away. I want the freedom to show the love of God outside of just these four walls, these very, very rigid cultural beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of those beliefs that we have are rooted in culture and not necessarily spirituality. So right. if I were to meet a man that says I'm spiritual, not religious, hey, we got a good conversation foundation to start. Like, what does that mean? Let's explore that because uh, like Candace said, we may be on the same page, you know, about how amazing God is and how love is the highest vibration frequency like we probably mm -hmm. speak the same language so mm -hmm. i'm i'm absolutely open to it and i suggest no one limit themselves yeah exactly exactly right. well ladies don't be swiping left when it say spiritual <laughs> right, right. right. Don't. 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 don't yeah 
See if the Lord doesn't drop them on Tinder for you. You never know. Okay. Well, this has been such a fun conversation, Candace. I am so glad we were able to connect with you. Uh, tell everybody like how they can pre-order this amazing book. I'm already speaking it. I know it's going to be so amazing. Thank you. you. Thank you. So yeah, you can follow me um, at Candace Benbo on Twitter and Instagram. Um, in both of my bios there, there's a link uh, to pre-order, but it's on Amazon. You can pre-order on Amazon, Walmart, Penguin Random House, um, Barnes & Noble, anywhere, any and all of the independent bookstores. So anywhere that you get your books, um, you can pre-order um, both the physical copy, the digital copy, and um, the Audible. Yay. Well, congratulations, sis. Thank I'm definitely rooting for you. And I can't wait to connect with you soon because I am coming to Atlanta. So we yes. have to we'll see each other soon. We'll see each other. Right. Bye. All right. Thank Bye. you. Oh, that was such great dialogue, you guys. And as we were talking, you know, about spirituality, it definitely had me thinking about like, as I think Majesty may have said, like the pandemics, you know, like effect on us and our spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you guys, you know, as it relates to business, you know, um, any tips that you want to share um, to pandemic proof your business? Because we don't know what's going to happen in the next day, in the next week, in the next month. So, um, yeah, I'd love to hear your tips. I think my main tip is that you should absolutely, if the pandemic has taught us anything, is you need more than one stream of income. Like, period. Like, one stream of income just doesn't do it. I think you need to have multiple streams of income, if possible. Um, and you need to find ways to multiply your money. Um, one thing that I teach, and, and I talk about it a little bit on Instagram, I talk about, you know, teaching how to multiply your money so that you can become part of the 1%. The 1% understands that no, not only do you need to have multiple streams of income, but you need to let your money work for you. So I think that's kind of my biggest thing, like find you a tool to multiply your money and make sure you have more than one stream of income. I love that. Um, I think my tip goes back to similar what we were talking about with what the church trend did with all right, we're, we're in person. It's not safe for us to gather in person. So we're streaming and using um, digital, online, and other means. I think the pandemic has taught me to utilize the internet and to utilize social media because they never close. You don't have to be in person. And you can make money any time of day. Like, no matter what time zone, like, this is all around the world. And I think it, it really made a situation like the pandemic that feels so restrictive make you feel like you still have so many options. So I always encourage like, if there was anything you did in person, can it be done virtually? Um, is there anything that you can make a digital product, a downloadable, um, just like Candace mentioned, she has a book, but you also can get a, a, an ebook. So my thing is like, what can you download? What can you stream? What can be audible? Um, I know Lily May, you mentioned like, you start doing like clubhouse conversations, like what things can you use tools, social media and the internet for to keep revenue going? Like, I'm sure with y'all, I've gotten booked for speaking engagements. I haven't had to be in any physical rooms. I can do it online. So if you have certain skills, they should be able to transfer from in-person to online so you can keep those revenue streams going, just like Winter said. Absolutely. And so my advice would be to create a four or five figure signature offer to attract a higher end clientele, because this is the thing about people who are top level earners. The pandemic does not stop them from spending on their business. All right. I think people kind of get into this place like, oh, you know, there's a lockdown. People are going to stop spending money now. And there are a lot of high valuable people that you can connect with and do business with who, you know, the pandemic does not stop their income. The pandemic does not stop them from investing into their business. So when you have a high ticket offer for that higher end clientele, then you can connect with a more stable source to fund, you know, your business efforts. So that, and I know that's probably an unusual tip to share, but I think, you know, if you kind of reshift a part of your business to cater to a higher end clientele, they're not going to be shook by a shutdown because, the bank account is straight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, that's real. And Lily made to support what you're saying. I know so many people now that the pandemic has happened are investing more in self-education and self-development. Like before the pandemic, I had never enrolled in a mastermind. I, I spent the most money I've ever spent in a mastermind to develop. And so I think, like you said, if 
the pandemic, if somebody didn't offer that and it was a five figure class, but this person made six figures consecutively. And I'm like, OK, let me learn some tips of the trade. And I think that's how we continue to hone in our craft. But if that wasn't offered, then that person could lose out on money because, like you said, people like us are always willing to invest in our business, invest in our minds. I think when to the last episode, you were talking about just constantly learning and just staying on top of stuff like mm -hmm. I think that's smart if you have a signature offer. And like you said, Lily, made like certain things that could be evergreen. So you could come up with a signature offer and do it one time and sell it, sell an e-course or something. You don't have to physically show up or you could have a signature offer where you have less people would make more money and you're investing in porn in a small like um, capsule group or, or, or uh, a smaller group of people that you can invest in without having to have a lower ticket with so much volume where it could be exhausting. Exactly. And I'm so glad that you mentioned a mastermind because I actually created a mastermind group for women CEOs. And it has been so phenomenal because essentially you get to connect with women with different levels of expertise in different industries and you come together privately to help up level each other's business. And so a mastermind alliance is something that Napoleon Hill spoke very highly of because he said you can accomplish in one year within a mastermind group more than a lifetime because you can leverage someone else's insights, education, resources. So you guys definitely connect with me if you want to be in my mastermind. I'm definitely looking for other brilliant women CEOs to bring it to the fold because I do think that is another way to pandemic proof your business. And speaking of the pandemic, so we're all, you know, really focused on our health, our immune system, the vitamins, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, what, you know, health hacks do y'all want to share to kind of keep, you know, the immune system strong? Health hacks. I think um, I used, I stopped and I'm going to start again was uh, using the sea moss. Create, you know, like I would buy the raw sea moss and create the gel and I was drink. I was taking it every day, a couple tablespoons. And I remember that was like, I was the skinniest. Um, I had the most energy, great, you know, and, and I was running every day preparing for a marathon and I had zero body aches. And I started thinking about that last night, like, okay, I had zero body aches. I was the skinniest I've ever been. It wasn't just the running because people know you can run and not be skinny. There are people mm -hmm. who run who are not thin. Um, but I started looking at, you know, how I felt during that time. And I think I'm going to start re reincorporating sea moss into my diet. Mm, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, it has 97 of the 107 nutrients that we need. So, and I feel like, you know, if you're constantly feeding your body that, you should be able to fight pretty much anything. It's good. It's good. My pandemic health hack, I invested in a Peloton. And primarily because when the gyms first closed down, I was like, oh, my God, I'm just going to be eating and sitting in the house. Like, I, I'm going to blow up because I'm, like, not even five foot. So my weight has nowhere to go but, like, out. So I was like, let me get a Peloton. And it was the best investment because in addition to the bike, um, the app allows me to like share stuff on my TV screen. I can do yoga. I can do meditation. It's been fantastic. And their um, instructors are very diverse. The music selections, like I can be like, okay, I got 20 minutes. I want to do a Caribbean mix or I got 30 minutes. I want to do a hip hop. I, I like, I like that it keeps it fun. Um, Cause I'm not as much of a shrimp trainer. My husband will go to a gym in pandemic with a mask on and, and like weightlift two hours for six days a week. And I just, I can't do it. So uh, Peloton has been a huge lifesaver for me, but I know it's an investment too. So I would say uh, a free version of another health hack is if you have a smart TV, like the YouTube app, it's so many free trainings on YouTube. Like if you search at home fitness, you can get you a good living room workout. That is so funny. I actually last night just invested into the Peloton stock. So that's so funny that you said that because oh, I feel yeah. like once the shutdown happens again, then everybody's going to need a bike so they can keep working it out. So <laughs> they're making some money. Let me tell you how long I had to wait for my bike. I was like, oh, Peloton is making coins. If you got stock, you're going to make some money. I had to wait 10 weeks for my bike. It was on back order. Wow. I was like, you know how much weight I'm going to gain? Wait for this bike. <laughs> Correct. That is so funny. But I do want one too. So I need to actually invest in the actual bike too, so that I don't get fluffy. But one of my um, health hacks is soursop bitters, right? And it's available at the Jamaican grocery store. So I'll literally be like going across town to the Jamaican grocery store because there's so many benefits. Now it tastes like turpentine. Like it tastes like 
car motor oil, right? So you know it's probably good if it tastes terrible, but yeah, it has so many good things in it, you guys, that are good for like detoxing, um, expelling the mucus, which is a uh, one of the things that really suppresses people's immune system is built up mucus. And so another health hack is to really cut out dairy because dairy really contributes to that mucus that suppresses the immune system. We're kind of half and half in my house. Like milk has always hurt our stomach. So we always substitute milk. So we do like oat milk, almond milk, coconut milk. But then when it comes to the cheese, it's like, in my opinion, I'm like, the real cheese tastes real good. <laughs> Right. So we're kind of half one foot in, one foot out. We still do the eggs, but like milk based stuff, we always do the substitute. Yeah, it's it's a, a work in progress. This whole health journey, you, you know, you just got to take steps. So I give myself grace <laughs> when I, you know, dip into the real cheese. I give myself a little grace and then try again tomorrow. But this has been such a fun show, you guys. Uh, we covered a lot of things. It's such a great conversation uh, with Candace about spirituality. So I hope that those of you that tuned in, definitely click below to subscribe to the channel. Definitely share the link with a few friends. Hope everyone enjoyed this show. Again, please subscribe. Please share the link with at least five friends and definitely comment below to let us know what you think. And that concludes our second episode. Bye.